Hello Space Fans, I'm Scott Lewis and welcome to another edition of Space Fan News. Even though it's been in service for 23 and a half years, astronomers are still finding amazing new research to perform with the Hubble Space Telescope. The newest mission is called Frontier Fields and is already underway, doing things that seem only possible in science fiction. You see, astronomers will be pointing the Hubble Space Telescope, the Spitzer Space Telescope, and the Chandra X-ray Observatory at galaxy clusters in order to use the gravitational lensing caused by its dark matter to look even further into the universe, and thus even further back in time. The furthest we've been able to see in the optical wavelengths is around 13.2 billion years ago with the Hubble Extreme Deep Field, allowing us to see how the cosmos was doing some 435 million years after the Big Bang, but that's about to change. In fact, it already has. Hubble has already observed light from a galaxy that is around 420 million years after the Big Bang. Since gravitational lensing is achromatic, that is, it doesn't affect the color of the light that passes through it, astronomers will still be able to use color to determine the age, chemical composition, and even redshifts of the objects observed. Not only will we be discovering objects further back in time than we've ever seen, but the very use of gravitational lenses will give even further insight in how they work, along with the dark matter that makes them up. With the three great orbiting observatories looking at six gravity lenses in the infrared, optical, and x-ray wavelengths, the beginning of space and time as we know it just got a little bit closer. On October 24th, Tony and I hosted a Hubble Hangout introducing frontier fields to the public with many team members of the mission. The scientists described different ways that light works with gravitational lensing, what we're hoping Hubble will discover, as well as answering some questions from the Google Plus and YouTube audience. Speaking of YouTube, on the November 4th episode of SciShow News, Hank Green describes the importance of initial observations from Hubble. Full details of the episode is down in the doobly-doo. Scientists at UC Berkeley and University of Hawaii Manoa have announced some amazing news about the data collected during the Kepler mission. Even though Kepler became crippled and is no longer in service, its primary mission was a resounding success. The analysis of this data concludes that just over one in five sun-like stars have Earth-sized planets orbiting in their habitable zone. So what does this mean? Well, first of all, let's define what Earth-like means. Earth-like does not mean that it's a gorgeous blue marble floating around the star. Instead, it means that its diameter is anywhere between one and two times that of Earth, with its orbit allowing between one quarter and four times the amount of light that Earth receives. Scientists took the data from Kepler and used it with the twin Keck observatories atop Mount Akea in order to get very precise spectroscopic measurements. Using the high-resolution Echelle spectrometer, scientists used three CCD chips to get a large range of observed wavelengths, but also at very high resolution. The precise measurements allowed for the scientists at Cal and University of Hawaii Manoa to statistically deduce the prevalence of Earth-sized planets in habitable zones. Jeffrey Marcy at Cal states, the primary goal of the Kepler mission was to answer the question, when you look up in the night sky, what fraction of the stars that you see have Earth-sized planets at lukewarm temperatures so that the water would not be frozen or steam? Because liquid water is now understood to be the prerequisite for life. Until now, no one knew exactly how common potentially habitable planets were around sun-like stars in the galaxy. This new evidence sets up potential for successors of Kepler to directly image these Earth-sized planets orbiting in habitable zones. And with one of these candidates being a mere 12 light years away from our solar system, imagining humanity becoming a multi-stellar species becomes just a bit easier. One place that humanity really doesn't want to go is to a new type of quasar observed by an international team of astronomers. Here with me at YouTube Studios in LA is Fraser Kane to tell us more. Hey Fraser. Hey Scott, thanks for having me on Space Van News. Absolutely. So Quasar, which stands for a quasi-stellar radio source, is an accretion disk immediately surrounding a supermassive black hole. 
Using observational data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, astronomers noticed something puzzling that didn't necessarily conform with predictions of the current theories. Typically, there's so much energy involved with quasars that the matter in the accretion disk doesn't actually fall in towards the black hole, but is shot out away from it. The news observations appear to show the opposite happening in this rare type of quasar. How rare? Try one quasar out of 10,000, with only 17 ever being observed. Using measurements of the Doppler effect, astronomers have observations of the matter traveling in both directions, outward from and in towards the black hole. This does seem quite logical, for the black hole does need to devour matter to fuel itself. However, the vast majority of observations show matter being shot away from the supermassive black hole at velocities around 20% the speed of light, as in nearly 60 million meters per second. Since astronomers know that the supermassive black hole must be fed in order to remain, the primary question out of these observations is why? Why is it that we're finally able to observe this matter traveling towards the center of the black hole, and why is it so rare to observe? The leader of the research team, Patrick Hall of York University, states that it is possible that the observations are not of the matter heading into the black hole, but slightly above it. He uses this analogy to explain the concept. Imagine an ant on a spinning merry-go-round crawling from the center to the edge. You'll see the ant moving towards you about half the time and away from you about half the time. The same idea could apply to the gas in these quasars. In either case, the gas in these quasars is moving in an unusual fashion. This new data will need to be taken into account for theoretical models of quasars. The team will be using the Gemini North Telescope on Mauna Kea to get even more data to more precisely define which changes need to be made to the models. Awesome, Fraser. Thanks for joining me this week on Space Fan News. This episode was filmed at YouTube Space LA, and we here at Deep Astronomy want to extend a huge thank you to everyone here for access to the awesome facilities and resources. Also to Fraser Kane and Jason Harmer from Universe Today. Make sure to subscribe to their channel. More information below in the description. Major thanks to Hank Green and the entire team at SciShow for sharing the word on Frontier Fields. Their information is below in the doobly-doo. Doobly-doo. Make sure to subscribe in DFTBA. Well, that's it for this week, space fans. Thank you all for watching, and as always, keep looking up.